Le monde, c'est nous. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us this day on another edition of the program. It is Views on the Continent on the Pan African Television Africa Media. We come today to discuss issues affecting the global world and, of course, uh, and Africa. And we are looking at how the United Nations Security Council recently uh, discussed on how they can maintain, uh, ensure peace and bring resolve to the uh, Ukrainian crisis. And today we are focusing on uh, this uh, recent uh, meeting where the United Nations Security Council in January 2023 convened in its routine sessions to discuss the maintenance of peace and security in Ukraine as the world continues to bear the adverse effects of the crisis Key officials present a strong point pertaining the flare between Russia and Ukraine in how the United Nations Security Council can act in solving it. Among the speakers were Anna Devli and uh, Enrique, uh, international lawyer and journalist respectively, who addressed the council showing evidence gathered while on mission to the areas at war. Devli reiterated on the risks linked to weapons an issue the Council and Interpol are keen and have warned against. He noted that weapons initially destined for Ukraine have been rerouted elsewhere, raising another problematic force. It seems, according to him, that specific measures have not been implemented by the West to prevent the rerouting of a considerable portion of these weapons to other theaters of operation. Lecture person has been made very susceptible due to the proliferation of arms and arming of terrorist organizations like Boko Ram and ISIS. And he reiterated this during his meeting where he called uh, on uh, um, Nigerian President Mohamed Bouhari, where he challenged his other peers, calling on other security forces to ensure that uh, there are no, uh, uh, there is no proliferation of arms, especially in the electorate basin, which undermines security, not just in the electorate, but in the Sahel region. So today uh, in the program, we want to analyze the current state of affairs in uh, affected areas, uh, in Ukraine uh, and get a better understanding of the Ukrainian uh, uh, crisis from this uh, uh, expert or panel of experts joining us this day to continue to talk about issues affecting the global world. Uh, it is uh, uh, good knowing you're onto the Pan-African television, African media, and of course, looking at the recent uh, uh, speech delivered by uh, uh, Anna Davli, uh, an international rights uh, lawyer, among other officials presenting, of course, uh, first-hand evidence uh, after their visits to affected areas or areas at war, Donbass and Donetsk, uh, among others, uh, in, of course, bringing to light uh, the realities as far as the Ukrainian war is concerned. Without wasting much time, we're good to uncover this great panel this day. And I'll be glad to introduce to you uh, Mr. Arnold Dovley. He's an international rights lawyer. Hello to you, sir, and thanks for joining us on the Pan-African Television. And uh, hello, uh, and now I'm very happy to be on the show and uh, looking forward to discuss all the uh, issues that uh, you've uh, introduced to our viewers. Which is very important uh, at this time uh, uh, of great propaganda and, of course, misinformation regarding the development uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine or patterning the uh, Ukrainian crisis. We are going to meet uh, Henry Kia Fifuyu. He's a political analyst and also a journalist. Hello to you, sir, and thanks for joining us this day on Afric Media Television. Thanks a lot for this opportunity to talk, and uh, very glad. And it's always a pleasure to have you share your viewpoints on issues uh, concerning the the global world at large. Eh? Having another lady joining us now is uh, Fiorella Isabel. She's a journalist and, of course, a geopolitical analyst. It's a pleasure having you this day eh, on the Pan African Television, Isabel. 
Thank you for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. Looking forward indeed to having a constructive discussion that will bring more light uh, to uh, the uh, state of affairs in uh, uh, patterning the Ukrainian uh, crisis. And to those of you just tuning in now, it is Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television. It is informative as well as interactive. In the course of the program, you have a number that you can call and participate and share on view of what you think about uh, the state of affairs patterning the Ukrainian in a crisis and of course what is at stake the role of the security council and of course the role of the western train to the hotel of course uh, that uh, there is not divergent of weapons as uh, uh, Anna Devlia underlined during his uh, presentation to the United Nations Security Council I'll first of all start with you Mr. Anna Devlia you addressed the United Nations Security Council that was in uh, January uh, should be on the 13th of January, if I'm correct, uh, and you presented quite a lot of points patterning uh, the uh, situation uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine uh, as you actually embarked on a, uh, on a mission to the affected or the areas that were to get up first in information. So holistically, what have you to say uh, uh, regarding your speech uh, to the United Nations Security Council and also what you witnessed while uh, on ground? Yes. Well, uh, my, the uh, UN Security Council centered on uh, three points essentially. The uh, first one uh, dealt with the uh, flow of weapons and the increasing uh, uh, caliber of the uh, weapon system to uh, Ukraine. Uh, all this at the expense of diplomacy. So I was trying to stress that at some point the uh, the uh, the blowback will be uh, inescapable because all of that weaponry is for fifty percent not given away uh, into the theater, it's instead being sold on the dark web and uh, found its way into uh, Africa. I underline that uh, this issue has been uh, addressed by the president of Nigeria during a recent summit in December in the next area, uh, bearing on the idea that basically those uh, weapons, if not uh, kept in check, will find their way uh, into the hands of uh, proxies and uh, terrorist organizations such as uh, uh, Boko Haram and or ISIS. And so this would uh, uh, destabilize in, uh, the security situation. So this was the, the first point. The second point that I made is basically this idea that the conflict in Ukraine uh, would have uh, started on uh, February 24, 2022, when obviously there is a, a wider context uh, going back to 2013 and, and uh, uh, spanning all these rounds of negotiations, uh, bearing on uh, what came to be known as the Minsk Accord, uh, and uh, for which we uh, found from uh, former Chancellor uh, Merkel, former French President Hollande, and today former Ukrainian President Borchuka, that this small uh, shenanigan was but shenanigan, uh, basically destined and, and, and uh, designed to provide time, I quote, to the Ukrainian army to rearm and uh, be able down the road to engage in a military conflict, which basically uh, defeats the whole purpose of the uh, Minsk Accord. And so in that respect, I uh, try to get some light legally on uh, justification of what has been uh, known now as the uh, special military operation in the uh, Russian Federation, by basically uh, uh, trying to the spotlight on the fact that there is to uh, resolution 22, which is the uh, UN version of the court, which bears on all the uh, signatories to the court, uh, whether individually and or jointly, to take any and every step to ensure a peaceful resolution to the conflict, uh, bearing on the memorandum of uh, the Minsk. Random of 2014. So, 
when basically you examine the uh, provisions of the uh, sport, you find out that there were uh, two, if not three, fundamental uh, aspects that needed to be addressed. The first one was the possibility for the uh, uh, local authorities in zones uh, of uh, Luhansk and Donetsk to uh, basically uh, choose their own representative so as to organize uh, the team status. And this was to be discussed with the Kiev uh, authorities uh, before uh, being implemented into a revised constitution. Obviously, this never happened because Kiev decided to uh, ignore the uh, authorities and uh, the uh, above mentioned uh, and basically uh, move uh, and pass the law where they uh, take it upon themselves to uh, themselves those local representatives in those countries. And this was the first uh, obstacle, so to speak. Uh, the second obstacle had to do with the for uh, uh, Russian-speaking minorities' rights to uh, uh, express themselves in their native language. And obviously, there was a law that existed since 2020 in which uh, accomplished just that. Uh, that law was then uh, suspended uh, shortly after the May uh, and uh, was later declared unconstitutional in 2018. Uh, so basically, uh, Russian-speaking uh, uh, minorities were uh, denied the right to speak their own languages, and this had been, you know, basically one of the main stops of the, uh, the conflict uh, in Ukraine for uh, ever since uh, the end of the Soviet Union. Last but not least, there was to be uh, some kind of amnesty and some kind of uh, uh, accounting for some of the actions that have taken place shortly after the Maidan coup. Uh, obviously, that referred to the uh, of the things to the uh, the uh, 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 House of uh, Syndicates, and for which uh, up to this day, uh, and so basically this is on uh, underlining the fact that uh, in former Ukraine, uh, not everybody is equal before the law. So when we find out that basically uh, in the wake of uh, the French uh, president, former French president and the former chancellor, and now today the former Ukrainian president, uh, that the whole uh, Minsk uh, process was but a stalling tactic, uh, we understand uh, the Russian Federation and not only as uh, Members uh, uh, participated uh, participated, uh, to act to ensure that blockchain did not ensue. We also, as we found out now with the biolab situation, uh, to prevent uh, uh, grievously armed under its own territory, its own population. And so this brings us where we are today. And unfortunately, diplomacy right now is being completely. Uh, put on a side, on the side line. and uh, what we're seeing is an increased uh, uh, tone in uh, belicist uh, statements from the West. Uh, everybody is tripping over each other to try to provide uh, the equipment care with ever get equipment, not bearing in mind that um, you know, in terms of the tanks, about the tanks. 300 tanks when the Russian Federation is estimated to go between 12,000 and 15,000 tanks. Um, so that's basically uh, that gives you an idea of the utility of this uh, course of action. At which I would add the idea that the uh, Russian general staff is going to be and contingency plans are uh, just as we uh, uh, to prevent. Uh, Weapons even making into the war. So this is uh, this is the state of affairs right now. And uh, to uh, uh, basically wrap up on on your initial question, bearing on the U.S. security, uh, we were confronted with uh, 
the suspects, I would say, the, the, the big three, uh, UK, US, and France, basically uh, felt the same, which was that uh, uh, Russia I think, was trying to divert from its own act of aggression. And uh, basically, uh, uh, we go uh, with what they were saying, uh, up with an alternative uh, narrative to conservatives. Uh, so we are not on the same page. And in terms of reference, uh, that are being used from uh, by Russia and its allies, we are light years away from uh, relating to a uh, sensical approach as to reality on the ground. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Devley. I'll be coming back, of course, to you to <coughs> get uh, more uh, information or more insight uh, of some, on some of the points uh, you just uh, highlighted. But then, uh, before coming back to you, let's continue with uh, Enrique. Uh, as a journalist uh, and also political analyst, uh, you've been able to make trips uh, to the affected areas. Uh, so, uh, uh, at this juncture, what can you make of the situation or uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine, or what can you say uh, uh, can be done uh, to, to advert the, the, uh, the, the situation between uh, uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine? Well, in uh, in the in the most important question is that uh, since many years the conflict in Ukraine was totally forgotten by uh, European media and European politics. Uh, I think after. Uh, Battle of uh, Airport and the Battle of the Balsevo, uh, this means uh, January, February 2015. Uh, this conflict was absolutely forgotten in uh, our media in Europe, and uh, only after uh, February of uh, 2022 came again into the mainstream media and uh, some interesting detail. Uh, European politics has started to say that uh, it's the first conflict in Europe after 70 years, so after Second World War. But uh, what happened in uh, Yugoslavia during the, the 90s, during the 10 years from uh, 1999 to 1280? Uh, uh, for example, with the independence of uh, Kosovo backed by USA, for example. Or other interesting question, the invasion of uh, the island of uh, Cyprus by, Tur by Turkish forces. This is very important because Cyprus is a member of the European Union and this conflict is absolutely forgotten too. So not only uh, Balkans, also this question in uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, with regards to uh, Ukraine, the conflict is uh, wa was in the shadow, better, uh, during many years. And uh, of course, uh, after the words of uh, ex-former President Merkel in uh, December, uh, so uh, almost uh, two months ago, that uh, uh, Sorry for the mm, sounds, my cats are crazy. And, and uh, coming back to, to the question, uh, Merkel stated that uh, Europe only wanted to, uh, to gain time for improve uh, uh, military uh, armed forces of Ukraine and uh, win the war uh, by the weapons, not by the peace. So. This means that uh, agreements of Minsk were absolutely wasting of time, in spite of uh, Russia attempts and uh, Donetsk and Lugansk attempts for gaining um, peaceful uh, solution. So what this means, uh, the working of the conflict is, uh, is the same in every place in the world. Uh, this means USA or other proxy force will use some concrete uh, vulnerabilities in the targeted country and uh, they try to create an inner conflict or uh, an inner conflict in case uh, the cop of that uh, won't be absolutely won't be an absolute uh, victory and uh, 
uh, I think in Africa this uh, this uh, this will result a very familiar with regards to creating cyber wars, uh, inner conflict, uh, coup of uh, coup of uh, state, and and uh, so on and so on. In the case of Ukraine, it's also interesting because. Madre que te parió. Sorry, sorry. It's a uh, changing of flattened. Uh, okay, uh, coming back to the to the question. And sorry again. Um, Ukraine. Ukraine uh, sometimes was located in Europe and sometimes not. As I presented in uh, in the Security Council, I was in the trenches. I was in a place. Of, not not to where the where there was only one trench but a net of trenches in the Donetsk side and in Ukrainian side that means one year ago in 2016 I was in 2016 uh, Merkel and Holland were in the battlefield of Verdun and they said that oh we cannot uh, afford us a new war in Europe. No more trenches, no more wars. And uh, okay, I was in the trenches. I was in Europe or not Europe or what? What was concretely Donbas? It's some kind of uh, tactic, uh, tactical amnesty. It's better not to remember some things. Uh, by the by the opportunity i this means okay sometimes europe uh, europe reaches uh, to ukraine sometimes not uh, but uh, if they said that uh, donbass is ukraine and ukraine is europe so it was a trenches war in europe but uh, suddenly they forgot and that, that's the question of uh, hypocrisy of these uh, two faces, two values. Sometimes uh, there are very important things, sometimes there are very important wars, and sometimes nothing exists. Everything is forgotten, everything is put uh, behind the curtain, and uh, that's the question. But because people is suffering the war, people was suffering the war during nine years up to nowadays and what happened to these people these people n never mattered at all and it was in europe exactly as other conflicts are near of europe especially in uh, in north africa or uh, middle east and sometimes it's very important conflict and sometimes it's nothing nothing exists everything is is fine so that's why uh, my two key points is hypocrisy, two faces, uh, the interest, of course, for creating uh, a war, in this case, a war against Russia. In other cases, it's a war against Iran, a war against China. The, the um, hybrid uh, war, hybrid warfare style of attacking not to, directly to the to the target but indirect, uh, indirectly by attacking network and uh, the most important is to touch uh, the vulnerabilities of the country and make the momentum for this uh, coup of state or other pressure uh, sometimes the inclusion of uh, irregular armed groups uh, some sometimes some kind of uh, terrorist groups or uh, so-called guerrillas and uh, the final result is to destroy one uh, indirect target for uh, achieve, achieving a better result in this case of ukraine is to destroy russia to drag russia into uh, absolutely war and also to uh, turn apart uh, Europe. But of course, in Europe, uh, authorities, it seems that they don't understand or they cannot understand on, or they wa don't want to understand that th this war in Ukraine is not also against Russia, but it's also against Europe. And uh, these uh, are other examples that uh, in Africa uh, will be very interesting.
uh, of course, it is uh, imperative uh, to talk, discuss this because uh, the effect are actually felt also in, uh, in Africa as you and Ricky. Uh, I'll be coming back to you for us to, to continue to analyze uh, uh, this war. And uh, this war that has uh, come to the fore again. Eh? It came to the fore in February 2022, like uh, you and uh, definitely highlighted. And I will call also today asking the fate of uh, people of the Ukraine of, of, of people in uh, the affected uh, area and we are continuing the same perspective uh, to know that uh, the, this war that came to the fore in uh, February 2022 actually showed the changes that have been occurring at uh, the global or international uh, politics and of course the geopolitics, geo, uh, uh, politics across the world. Coming to you, uh, uh, Fiorella uh, Isabella, you are a journalist, and of course, you've been very keen uh, on the development in Ukraine, and you've visited uh, some of the areas affected by this war. So, in your own perspective, what can you say are the state of affairs at this particular moment, and uh, what is the way forward? Right, so as my colleagues um, just went over the historical context of how we got here, I, as a US American, my primary focus was to debunk the lies that are coming into the United States. The, the leader of the NATO collective, the one that has been pushing this war since 2014, since Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt went in there to manipulate an election and oust the democratically elected leader Yanukovych, as we all know. And uh, it's also worth mentioning, as my colleagues said, this was never, the Minsk Accords were never to be respected. It is so documented in the 2019 RAND document that pretty much outlined exactly how the West wanted to break up Russia by using the Balkans, by using conflicts and turning its own uh, people against it, its own allies. And we're seeing that play out in real time right now. So that is what I want to mention. Now, in terms of the what we saw in the Donbass, I think it's important for Western audiences and, and for your audiences to understand the West does not take information at what it is, it, it projects what it actually is doing to the so-called adversaries. It'll say Russia bombed a hospital uh, full of, of U Ukrainian civilians when in fact it was Ukraine that did this. We saw this play out immediately upon our arrival in Donbass, the bombing of a uh, hospital that we were explained to and this was of course on the un uh, security council uh me well the un meeting that our arno was a part of and he discussed this and we saw the 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 way this is of course warped in media is oh well ukraine didn't mean to hit this hospital uh but when you go there and you see that there's absolutely no justification there were no weapons around there's no this is clearly a public area and same thing when we saw of course flats and stores that were hit with u.s supplied high mars and one one thing that the west does is that the, it's specifically the united states they say well how do you know this wasn't russia trying to frame ukraine which is exactly what ukraine does uh again projection and so you go and you see we also got to see the remnants of the weapons that are only used by ukraine or are used by given to them by the european union or given to them by the united states these are specific weapons like high mars that are not something that the russians use so it completely debunks that and on the other level of course you have that the fact that the people of of the Donbass, the, the people that are living in these cities in Donetsk, where we were, um, have never felt uh, a lot. The vast majority of them are ethnic Russians, and there is this allegiance that they have to Russia and to not allow them to decide that they wanted to be a part of the Russian Federation, that they felt this way, that they wanted to practice a religion, speak the language, is extremely fascistic. And the United States, of course, always pats itself on the back as the reason why Nazis 
were defeated in uh during world war ii and of course to completely uh, obfuscate the fact that it was the soviet union that led to hugely that defeat through the loss of 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 so many so many lives and this of course isn't taught in the united states as uh, an american you're taught that the united states defeated nazis captain america that whole uh psychology is really important for people to understand this is why people so quickly fall into that narrative and of course the narrative began uh in 2014 but it also was pushed with russia gate in 2016 saying that there was um meddling from russians in the u.s elections to defeat hillary clinton which we know was absolutely false especially now with a lot of the twitter revelations but there's just been an ongoing debunking of this so what you're seeing right now play out in the current moment and what we're seeing play out in donbass's the the people of John Bass are fighting an existential war. It is a war that is not obviously against Ukraine, but against the entire collective of the West and against NATO, which is used as an organized terrorist group. Like it's it's an organization, but it functions only to the behest of the United States and the State Department that decides. What, who they're going to invade next, who is the villain. And for this moment, and for the longest time, really, Russia has been the villain. You can go back to the Red Scare and McCarthyism in the 1950s and 60s, where people were trained to hate Russia via propaganda, which the U.S. loves to talk about, the propaganda coming into schools, doing drills of nuclear uh, disaster, uh, doing uh, having movies where Russians are always the villain, having this sort of textbook, a historic completely re rewriting of history it, to really discount what the Soviet Union did at that point. And so it's not really that the United States is fighting any sort of ideology. It's that the United States is fighting a country that wants to be so sovereign and that is growing in influence. It's growing in political influence. It's growing in economic influence. And it's growing its allyship with other nations. And this is extremely important that have also been subjugated and attacked by the West, leading, of course, with the United States. And I'm talking about nations like China that have become huge allies to Russia, nations like Iran. And we see that U.S. allies like Israel can bomb countries in like Iran, like Iraq, like Syria constantly and, and to no, to no uh, absolute uh, consequence. The United States, of course, killed Qassam Soleimani. And you really didn't see any consequences of that. And so the this is what we're seeing here is there's a shift. And this is an attack by the West to, in their own sense, are fighting the, the existential war on their front to exist as the one unilateral power. And the reason I'm talking about this in, in context of, of, of what I saw in the Donbass is because this is what is at stake here and what the people of the Donbass have endured for the last nine years, the world didn't care about until they were told to care about it by the purveyors of the propaganda machine, which are, of course, mainstream media, and they're dominating, and they dominate every single outlet. And of course, people like us are called so-called propagandists. But you know, in an age where you live in a sort of mishmash of 1984 and uh the brave new world and all of these like post-apocalyptic literature novels coming to a front you realize that the people telling the truth are called propagandists and the propagandists are are calling themselves the tr the truth tellers the fact checkers and it's important for for journalists to go there especially uh I, I think if you call yourself a journalist and you're talking about the subject that matter the war in Ukraine or Russia Ukraine conflict, and you want to talk about the Donbass, going there changes everything. Uh, reporting it via statistical data, via numbers, via just straight news is one thing. And going there and seeing the results 
of this conflict and what it does psychologically to a group of people who at this point are fighting for the existence of their 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 country their culture as a whole and this is something that's never talked about it's not like countries want to take over the entire world and fight the united states russia was in some into some of putin's criticism extremely hesitant extremely restrained they they tried everything from the beginning and to try to avoid this conflict almost to the point of fault almost to the point of fault where they're trying every single turn to be diplomatic uh th that is some criticism that putin received why didn't he go in sooner that like we you know, there's so many things that were at play there but that Russia represents not just for Russians this fight for sovereignty, but for the people of the continent of Africa, for the people of Latin America. We're seeing these connections being made not just through BRICS, but we saw what went on in Salak recently with the uh, avoidance or the denial to uh, these uh, Latin American countries to ship weapons, their weapons, to uh, Ukraine. And because, of course, a, a State Department hack really said, hey, uh, any sort of ally to Russia needs to give their their weapons to Ukraine and 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 give them as charity or, or whatever to help Ukraine and stand with Ukraine. And all of these countries are denying this. Why? Well, because, first of all, why does the United States still feel that the Monroe Doctrine is in play, that they have to dictate to these countries what they can or cannot do? And you see the same thing in Africa, where the United States is upset of the connections that the Russian Federation is making with the African continent. You see, of course, the, what's going on in Burkina Faso and the ousting of the French in, in the region. And it's so important to really point this out because this is, I think there is, has been this wave of just counter uh just this this effect of countering the west now russia took a stand it's like when one person takes a stand and then everybody else sees it they're like okay we understand where you're coming from we understand that they're attacking your sovereignty that they're killing people and and now you know we have an opportunity to build an allyship the emergence of the bank accounts between iran and russia is extremely uh, important. And that is, is is indicative of where this is going. Of course, this multilateralism, this multipolarity scares the living daylights out of the United States because they can no longer say, well, we're going to sanction you. Well, if if they're if the United States, uh, if Russia and Iran are drifting away from SWIFT, then they don't the sanctions won't work. And so what they're doing is they're trying to, in this moment, really threaten us with nuclear war, threaten the world. And I say us because we are all part of this world. And they are elevating this by bringing back Crimea. All you will see in the media right now is we need to take back Crimea. We need to take back Crimea. Crimea decided long ago that it was part of the Russian Federation, that it, it aligned itself in this way and the united states is of course paints it to people still to this day that it was stolen that this is like something that russia did um and so many people got that conflict wrong and that was one of the conflicts that of course is is now being used to say well we're going to get crimea this is a, a huge red line and again they're pushing of course war with china via taiwan we're seeing the emergence of military drills so i think right now uh what i see happening and it is is just really really dangerous but it's also an opportunity for the rest of the world the world that is continuously discounted and forgotten by the you know the the beautiful garden uh, in in Europe and and the United States, right? The rest of the so-called world that that they consider the jungle, like in Africa, and this just detrimental, very just neo-colonial way that the United States and Europe continue to treat these nations in South America and Africa, these uh, these countries, and if, and you can include West Asia or the Middle East in that as well, are rising up and are making alliances that I think are really weakening the hold the the west has and john bass is the epicenter of that it is it is where all of this is is happening where all of this is is being looked at that the, these parts these regions these people what they're fighting for i think that is understood and it's it's very contagious to everybody that understands it and sees it because they're not the only ones that have been killed or have been maimed or have been enduring this this destruction just being there for a few days without water is something that was difficult for us and 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 just you know puts it in perspective 
the fact that we take the, these things, water, warm, warm water, hot water, uh, not hearing uh, shelling all the time, not being like, you know, on alert all the time. People live this way. And the United States, the people of the United States don't get to hear this because we're censored all the time. And and that that is something that I think we need to really push out. This is the only things we can do is uh, have these discussions and and you have it grow this with our audience. But I think if people need to understand that the the people of the United States don't necessarily want this conflict, they just are so propagandized in large, and uh, more and more people are speaking out. However, they're also being targeted for speaking out, and the economies of both Europe and the United States are falling apart. They are just absolutely falling apart. And I think because the United States has never witnessed a at home war, because look what we did. Uh, we're coming into the 20 years since the invasion of Iraq. Look what we did for for uh, not, when 9-11 happened. We went to war with Afghanistan and Iraq. And this is this is what happened when there was a self-inflicted sort of conflict in the United States via 9-11. We have never seen a war at home. And that is why I think so many people are so disconnected and are able to say things like, well, Russia wasn't provoked. They could have tried something else. That's a, That was another one of my missions is to really explain to people they really had no way out. This is like somebody coming to your home and trying to kill you and your family and you just standing by. This is this is that and much bigger. So uh, it, it's just something that I wanted to uh, relay. And uh, thank you for allowing me. Oh, Isabel, for the uh, great insight uh, on the uh, development uh, patterning of uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, war, like you underlined, uh, it is imperative to hold discussions like these to educate, uh, to enlighten the world on uh, the development or the realities uh, of, of what is happening in the affected area, Donbass, Donetsk, and other regions there, uh, uh, bearing uh, the burnt of uh, the Ukrainian war. Uh, to note that uh, the there's a drastic shift uh, in global uh, politics and of course we're looking at how this is affecting or the war in Ukraine has again uh, shown how this shift is affecting global politics. Coming back to you, uh, uh, Mr. Anadovli, we are going to look at it, uh, bring in the African perspective because it is imperative also to highlight Africa because what is happening at the international level is actually affecting the African continent and we see where global cooperation is uh, challenged at this particular moment. So in your own uh, perspective or opinion, what do you think are the trends uh, in uh, African politics that are most important that we really need to talk at this particular moment, which are somehow directly or indirectly uh, related to the uh, uh, political tensions at uh, the international arena. Please, can you activate you? Okay, yeah. Obviously, Ukraine was a uh, uh, an accelerator uh, in the uh, emerging of a multipolar world, and uh, I think uh, once the initial impact, uh, the uh, media onslaught made by the West against Russia was basically shown to be but just that, and that in the UN, at least General Assembly, resolutions that were being tabled one after the other started revealing. Uh, an interesting pattern, which was basically that um, as months uh, went by, uh, we led uh, uh, the whole process was uh, leading up to complete reversal of what was, uh, I guess, initially expected in uh, among Western pundits, uh, leading up to a point where now there's about 85% of the world at large, which if not completely uh, uh, and explicitly on behalf of Russia, at least taking somewhat of a distanced, uh, demurred approach to uh, the Ukraine situation, uh, to be sure that they, 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 they understand that not uh, in the interest to take one side or another. And as the hysteria uh, manifested by the United States and its uh, European allies, 
which is a uh, crescendo. Uh, Interestingly, the, the entire uh, international community, and I mean by that the real, the real international community, and not just those who uh, you know, make policy at the UN, uh, is basically, um, yes, um, slowly but surely understanding that if Russia can stand up, about you know 50 states arraigned against it in uh, an existential uh, uh, context then it is time for maybe everybody else to uh, take side and do what they can to uh, increase and accelerate and accentuate this uh, multipolar world. This is, this is what it's all about now. This, this is one for all the marbles, and, and Fiorella actually uh, put the finger on it. This is, Donbass is the epicenter, and uh, as a, as a uh, what do I call it, a, um, a ripple effect with the Ukraine uh, and then the Russian situation and then the NATO states are jumping in. Uh, we may be feeling as if, you know, we're teetering on the brink of uh, you know, nuclear holocaust and a lot of people have been, you know, warned against the use of nuclear weapons. Obviously, I referred to it earlier, when we don't seem to be dealing much in the way of rational people on the, on the Western side. But at the end of the day, uh, I think this is just a watershed moment, and we just need to stay, uh, you know, uh, stay, uh, stay the course. And uh, there's no going back to 2022 or 20, 2022, should I say? There's no going back. And uh, we, as people who have gone to Donbass, uh, have to uh, uh, keep in mind also that the, the people who live there have been going. Uh, through it for nine years, they express in an uh, unambiguous fashion their uh, willingness to join uh, the Russian Federation, to put an end to the nightmare. And uh, you know, as we speak, uh, uh, you know, again, there was a, an incident uh, yesterday. We were supposed, as we were there, to uh, go and visit his monastery on, on uh, January 18th. This was somewhat rendered uh, impossible because of. Uh, uh, the shelling on this of this place, which has useless to say no military uh, uh, significance and or value, and we found out again uh, that last night uh, there was another shelling. So, you know, this is what's going on now. We're dealing with a, a, a very, I would say, to borrow some kind of terms from the uh, current, uh, you know, uh, cancel culture. This, this kind of binary, non-binary. No, this is you've got what's right and what's wrong. You have the law and you have uh, the jungle. And I'm not talking about the jungle at uh, Dixit uh, Borel here. Uh, you have people who are hiding behind the law, but are in fact are defiling it and using it for their own cynicism, uh, uh, cynical ploy to try to uh, maintain some kind of hegemonic uh, uh, order when, if I may say so, uh, the emperor has no clothes. So, uh, this is really what's going on now, and Africa uh, has understood this. Uh, this is no coincidence that uh, the domino effect is increasingly, you know, uh, taking on a new momentum, Burkina Faso, Mali, the RDC. <clears throat> we had Peru uh, a couple of days ago uh, through its uh, popular expression, uh, calling for uh, you know Russian help to. Uh, help them get rid of the neoliberal puppets uh, that were installed uh, by the Davos group uh, uh, a couple of months back. So we are witnessing a, a global, uh, basically, uh, uprising against this uh, increasingly illegitimate clique, Western clique, which itself does not even speak through the prison of the nation state, but through uh, you know, the uh, barely concealed instrumentalization of those national uh, organs by a bunch of uh, uh, nameless, faceless, but also active, uh, uh, you know, individuals okay. who, uh, thanks to their wealth and their uh, uh, access and control over all the levers, whether it's the justice system, the big pharma system, uh, the police, the military, the media, are trying to uh, somehow, you know, um, hang on for dear life to maintain their, their, their control or what they perceive is their control 
But uh, this goes against the, uh, the, the, the trend, the historical trend. And uh, everybody at level or another, and Africa is no last on this, is getting, you know, instinctively uh, aware uh, and informed of what's going on, that uh, what's being sold and peddled through the mass corporate media is, uh, has no bearing in reality. And they are taking confidence into what they're doing. They, they actually start believing that they can overthrow uh, what is, uh, to me, has been an illusion all the time. But all it took was this kind of qualitative step, which basically was the Donbass and the, military, the special military operation was, was the tipping point. And uh, as uh, the sanctions are back, uh, backfiring, you know, Africa is understanding now that it's now or never. They have to take a stand. They have to position themselves and stick to their guns no matter what. Uh, they'll be vilified. They will, there's going to be, obviously, you know, good days and bad days. This is a probably a decade-long uh, shift in historical geopolitics. Um, the president of the Russian Federation said that much uh, later probably in the same speech. Uh, we're, you know, for the, until 2030, basically, we're, we're facing, you know, uh, Two opposite uh, 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 vision for the uh, for humanity. Uh, on one hand, we have the the agenda 2030, uh, Davos, uh, post national, uh, uh, asexual. Uh, uh, you'll eat insect. I have nothing and be happy about it. Yeah. And on the other hand, we have nations who understand and value the idea of owning their own means of production, having access to uh, raw materials. Understanding that economies are built in functions and, and manufacturing and not just some kind of wizardry, financial wizardry, and some kind of uh, uh, financial alchemy, and which basically leaves everybody poor uh, since you know they socialize the losses and privatize the profits. We've known that for the last 20 years now with the, uh, uh, the MBA president, uh, you know, uh, George W. Bush. So uh, this is it. I think this is this is the uh, the, the tipping point. This is what uh, people have been waiting for uh, for the last 20 years since 9/11. I would say you know uh, the trend uh, is is reversing. This is kind of like a uh, a starting ground moment. Uh, it's a, it's it's slowly but surely emerging the notion all throughout the world in South America, in Africa, in South in Southeast Asia that. Uh, you know, we if we stay the course, we can we can uh, uh, basically turn the table on this whole uh, on this whole thing and uh, free ourselves and and reclaim our destiny. Indeed, it is imperative, uh, like you have underlined, uh, uh, there is need uh, to free yourself and retake our destiny. And uh, we are talking about sovereignty here and looking at how uh, the, uh, uh, the, the changes occurring in the world are bringing new definitions of sovereignty. Uh, coming back to you, uh, uh, Enrique, you underlined uh, earlier on about your presentation at the United Nations Security Council, but then uh, it's more uh, 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 not just about the presentation, what are the expectations from the United uh, uh, Nations Security Council having presented the evidence uh, uh, gathered uh, from uh, the affected areas? So what are the expectations from the United Nations Security Council in solving uh, this uh, crisis? Well, my expectations are zero because, uh, of course, uh, Russia, China, other the rest of the world uh, has their own interest, their own worldview, and Western countries has their own uh, unipolarity point of view. So this means that uh, the uh, crushing the impact uh, each other is absolutely the the, the result that uh, we could expect. So as uh, as we saw in the in the event of. Uh, uh, Security Council, Western countries were aligned uh, in their own worldview, unipolarity, and uh, non-Western countries put uh, the light in uh, other multipolarity world, in other world different than different that uh, uh, Western world, Western countries uh, say something. And okay, it's the law. This is the 
international international uh, world ruled by by who by com common system global system no it's only ruled by uh, western countries the interest of western countries and i would like to put uh, the focus on one very important question on on ukraine because uh, since the beginning i was uh, watching and following this issue the 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 beginning is exactly when it happened the Maidan revolt and coup of coup of uh, state and so on and so on. This is very important because uh, it's the same methodology for this country and for many others to rule and divide. Okay, it's very simple, it's very historical, but what uh, they did, uh, they tried to create and they really created uh, divisions artificial divisions among Russian and Ukrainians. From the beginning, uh, in a racial base, in a linguistic base, in a cultural and religious base, and also historical base. So it, they try to make uh, a lot of gaps between uh, the uh, Russia and Ukraine and uh, what uh, what's the situation now. Okay, in uh, Ukraine, they grow a Ukrainian nationalism, which uh, think themselves as superior race, superior language, superior culture, uh, in definitely the uh, civilized uh, Western world against the uh, wild uh, Mongol, bloody Bolshevik uh, Russia. So this is the, the the wild part of the world, and they became the wall against uh, Russian barbarianism and if Ukraine cannot resist, uh, Russia will uh, uh, reach uh, Berlin, Paris or uh, Madrid or um, the galaxy. Uh, they, the, it's uh, it's um, interesting this, uh, this narrative because, and this is uh, the, the uh, touching point with Africa, it could be happened the same with other countries. For example, if uh, maybe Ethiopia, Nigeria or other countries in uh, in Africa, they became a regional uh, great power inside of these countries. There are a lot of people, a lot of languages, sometimes uh, several religions, and all of these points can be part of a common idea in the country, in the region, in the continent, or could be a gap, a cleavage between people. So, if uh, uh, nobody in the power can can understand this situation, the result will be uh, another uh, South Ukrainian, a South Ukraine in in Africa and many Ukraines in the world, because it's the same uh, the same uh, war, the, the same process to rule and uh, to divide and rule exactly as uh, we w we saw in the history but now of course there is a uh, different media different different uh, uh, tools as internet as uh, ngos this is very important too the influence from abroad to a country to uh, trying to uh, brand and target like, oh, you are an uncivilized country, sorry, but uh, we are here from the West, from the civilized West, to make you, bet to make you better. And uh, final point, uh, it's very interesting that uh, from uh, Europe, in my case I live in Spain, and uh, I follow a lot uh, the, the news from uh, Europe, they uh, saw that, oh, What's a problem? Russia and China are grabbing a lot of Ukraine, uh, African countries, like uh, grabbing, and, or uh, Russia and China is taking control of Africa. Like, uh, but Af in Africa, nobody has brains, nobody is person, no, nobody can select, can choose their own decision. Nobody is free for uh, for decide. It's like oh, uh, suddenly uh, we have some kind of uh, uh, wild pigs in our garden of Africa. So uh, it's very bad for Europe that these wild pigs of uh, Russia and China enter it in our garden. So we have to make something. Everybody is terrorist. Everybody is bad. Only 
uh, Europe and the Western worlds are the saviors of the whole uh, world. And uh, better that nobody will make some questions, because if you make some questions, you became Russian agent uh, or Chinese agent or Iranian agent or uh, some foreign bad agent of influence in your country. And uh, two points in the end, from the times of uh, coronavirus and uh, from uh, past year with uh, the beginning of the uh, Russian operation in Ukraine. We saw in Europe, we were witness of it because started the, the global uh, pandemic, started the Russian operation and also started the, the greatest censorship in Europe. If you were against the official narrative, you are foreign agent, you are very bad person, you are a criminal. And that's the uh, things we see in, in Europe. If you are against the mainstream media, the mainstream politics, they will try to destroy absolutely. So uh, coming back uh, from the beginning of the question, uh, Security Council is a place to give uh, your speech, to give your experience, your knowledge, all the best you have. And uh, some of the countries, some of this rest of the world will hear you and Western world, Western countries uh, only read the, the manufactured uh, speech and we are you are bad, Russia is bad, China is bad, everybody is bad except uh, the Western world, except the uh, USA, Europe and this uh, little garden. Problematic lies, uh, uh, like you have underlined, uh, Enrique. Yeah, uh, you do not expect much from the uh, United Nations Security Council, of course. But, but then uh, uh, there is hope uh, that the, the the situation in Ukraine uh, comes to an end, uh, uh, that we curtail or mitigate uh, the the grave effect of uh, what is happening presently, and uh, this. Uh, brings us again to see how the quest uh, by superpower to, 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 to be at the, the, the helm of, of worlds where narratives or politics is actually uh, uh, driving the world apart and changing uh, global politics. And uh, it is on that note, uh, Isabel, that we're going to analyze, look at how the Ukrainian crisis or the latest development uh, has actually affected in international politics. And of course, we want to know how you perceive uh, this or how this is perceived in the North and South America. Uh, the last part, can you repeat? I'm sorry. We are looking at how the, the, the Ukrainian war has uh, caused a shift uh, in uh, global politics. Uh, and of course, looking at how this is perceived in North and uh, South America, in, uh, to see that, that of course, uh, we are talking about bringing a solution. But then, when we listen to Enrique uh, bringing doubt if the United Nations Security Council can actually bring a concrete solution to this crisis. So we want to see how this, of course, has cause a change in global politics in your own perspectives? Yeah, of course. Um, this has uh, greatly impacted global politics and global economics. It's sometimes a uh, a push is needed for, for people to act. And in, in its own actions, the West is isolating itself away from allyship or a trade with other nations in uh, like China and Russia. We're seeing the effects of the high energy cost in Europe where people are paying just so much money, thousands of euros to stay warm. And they're being told to go to really ridiculous methods to stay warm this winter because they can't afford it. We're seeing a shortage of, of basic things in the United States like eggs um, because people are smuggling them and they're, they're keeping them because they're afraid of what's to come. Uh, we're seeing, of course, the, the United States is using the destruction of Europe, particularly Germany, because Germany was the one that uh, depended high, hugely on the use of low energy imports from Russia. But in, in, in their attempt to go after Russia, which I think their attempt is double edged, I think their attempt is also to sink uh, the EU, um, as, as Victoria Nuland said, F the EU. 
because this is their this is their agenda. They don't care how many allies they throw under the bus. Once you know you're a U.S. ally, be careful because they can throw you under the bus at any given moment. And they're doing that to Europe right now. They're sinking the entire economy, which is why you're seeing protests against NATO, against sanctions on Russia, because the people of the EU are suffering. And this has also greatly affected Africa, the continent of Africa. We're seeing high costs uh, for fuel. We're seeing the grain that was supposed to be exported to the countries that needed the most go to Ukraine instead. This has been pointed out continuously by the Russian Federation and the Russian Foreign Ministry. And the, the, it's never addressed. Uh, the United States and Europe always gloat about being there as the saviors, as, as uh, both of my colleagues mentioned. But they never actually do anything to help these countries and these and these nations, which is why they are looking for al alternative partners. This is why you're seeing um, when Sergey Lavrov just finished the his multi leg trip to the African continent, where he met with his counterparts in uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea, when he met with his counterparts in South Africa and and just had these conversations he was welcomed compared to the way the americans are not welcomed or they're looked at with suspicion it's not because they as as i think arno mentioned uh they want to take over uh, uh russia or russia wants to take over africa it's because there is an equity there there's a mutual respect and relationship and this has been said too by the leadership in eritrea where you know that there is this relationship with russia dating back to the soviet union through their aid and decolonization during the apartheid, through their aid in helping these nations maintain their sovereignty, that hasn't changed. And um, it was, of course, lessened in recent years, but it has reemerged in this sort of like kinship because of the fact that these people of these countries have been affected and vilified by the West. In Africa, you know, recently, the because Sergei Lavrov was there, the Germans got mad and put, put out angry, very, very disrespectful, and you could even argue racist tweets about, you know, um, a leopard, and, and Sergei Lavrov was just there to see leopards as if that's all Africa is and the people of Africa are as if they don't have a mind of their own and they're just choosing to build these relationships for economic purposes because we know that countries in Africa uh, and countries in Latin America, when we're talking about South America, Central America, have really rich natural resources. In fact, they are the richest when it comes to copper, lithium, uh, mining, the mining industry. But unfortunately, what's been happening is this new uh, neo-colonialism where, of sure, it's not the old uh, age colonialism, but you have the neo-colonialism that has been uh, perpetuated by the West where they try to reap all the benefits and all the riches are taken out of the of the people of these of these countries and we're seeing africa wake up to that wake up to building their own banking infrastructure wake up to really taking charge of this not that they haven't before but you know of course with regime change and and the push i mean how many times has the united states been in somalia how many times i has the united states uh been involved in coups in haiti and in coups in latin america yeah, you, uh, pretty much every single country in Latin America has had a, a U.S. backed coup. We're seeing one right now in Peru. We saw one uh, in Bolivia. We saw one an attempt in Venezuela. We've seen the the vilification of Cuba, and of course, Cuba and Russia are building those relationships as well because the country is, is such a small island and it's suffering from a sixty year blockade. So you see all of these uh, things happening. And what Arno also mentioned that I want to point out is the. Um, the 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 agenda this global agenda that agenda is focused primarily on the fourth industrial revolution which is primarily focused on not on on um in, like just acquiring land but you have to follow the money it's acquiring resources wealth that these countries primarily in africa and uh, latin america and parts of the middle east have not just oil but minerals and these minerals are very important specifically for the building of technology that the West wants to impose. And they also push, of course, this green agenda where they say, oh, we all need to be green. 
Um, but that is killing the economy of the EU right now because of the high energy costs. And also they expect Africa to really follow this green agenda when they are they are in a completely different place economically because of Western intervention um, and this, this sort of handicap that that's provided. And also because the, the wealth is exported out of their countries and they are trying to build these relationships with China and with Russia because this partnership, these partnerships will be equitable, they'll be more um, mutually beneficial. And that's all that it is. And so you're you're seeing this expectation of these African countries to follow this green uh, energy and a lot of the waste from all of these products, the, the, these, the, these minerals and these batteries that are used to build, say, these Tesla cars are go to the African continent and they produce a lot of just unhealthy side effects for the people living. Nobody talks about that because the United States and the West consider the African continent and the Latin American continents, their backyard uh, in, in, so in, this, in Latin America, especially their backyard, Africa, their, their uh, you know, own land to colonize any way they see fit. And this extends, of course, to Europe because Europe does whatever the United States wants. Uh, and at this point, uh, they're letting the United United States think their economy. Meanwhile, you have a reemergence of uh, the of effect of national sovereignty. You're seeing leadership in speak out against giving uh, weapons to Ukraine. As I mentioned, the uh, Colombian president recently uh, said that not a single we a single weapon will be given to Ukraine. And this is something the United States, of course, hasn't expected. Colombia is its only NATO partner um in the in the whole of of south america and so that is changing for them they have lost uh they they have lost this uh ability to rein in full control of latin america and in spite of the, the fact there's still so much turmoil what we're seeing with peru uh, as was mentioned peru has been asking for a russian intervention because they're seeing like this these people the people of russia stand up to uh, the hegemony that is the U.S. and it's infectious. It's like, wow, we we're not the only ones that have been pushed out that aren't aren't allowed to choose our own leaders and aren't allowed to have our own culture that aren't allowed to to decide for ourselves what we want, even if we decide wrong. That's all it is. It's it's it's, it's all about national sovereignty for the people of these countries and 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 just a respect. The people of these countries in Latin America, they don't want to stop. Uh, having economic relationships with the United States, they want to have relationships with everybody. It, it's never, it's never been about attacking the West. It's been about simply deciding for themselves. But the West hasn't allowed this uh, this mutual relationship. And so, what's been going on is the the uh, the building of of this multilateralism, multipolarity. And we saw that in Salak. There's an attempt to uh, for Latin American countries, particularly Bra uh, Brazil and Argentina, that Brazil largely trades with Europe to um first of all they Brazil rejoins the lock which is important and then they remained in BRICS which is also important and there's this attempt to build a new currency and even if that attempt is is not you know it's not fully formulated even if it's like still uh in its like baby steps if it's not going to be the most effective you're seeing this attempt to uh, de-dollarize nations, to have these nations be fully independent from the West, because they understand that, sure, fine, we'll work with you, but uh, you know, most of them, I'm, there are some more radical nations that refuse to work with the United States than being Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. But the, the vast majority of Latin America is completely open to working with the United States, but they don't want to be cooed. They don't want to have their, their wealth go into uh, Europe and and the West and, and for their people to live in poverty, which is what's been happening for the last, uh, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. And um, they also are starting to understand this, this whole agenda, because at the end of the day, you're, you have two polar opposites uh, uh, ideologies here. And it's more so against an ability for people to be to decide for themselves and to have the ability to be human beings. And the other side wants to dehumanize people and control people and just have them do what what they decide is best for them and you're seeing that that whole agenda through the green revolution through it's a, it's like the green energy push 
the uh, push for um, just this sort of idea of just artificial intelligence, microchipping, making everything into an app, making your identity via these uh, the, the 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 surveillance state become this sort of digital ID that we've been seeing coming up in the last few uh, World, World Economic Forum uh, discussions. And that's not conspiracy. That's a reality. And who stands to lose the most in those agendas? Who's not really invited to the table really fully or who's not, you know, who's not really looked at? You know, it, it's it's the people, the civilians of the African continent, the civilians of the Latin American continents. Lithium is going to be huge when it comes to this agenda and lithium is of course like i said dominated in uh, africa and in latin america and that's why you're seeing such a push in peru right now uh to control to put in a u.s puppet that will allow the multinational corporations to come in and take away this lithium that's so crucial for the development of this tech that they want so uh there's so much to that and i think this conflict in ukraine um this special military operation that Ro russia has taken upon itself is is really highlighting all of this that was there it's really tying it in together none of these things are disconnected from each other in fact they are all connected from each for, to each other and that's what we really need to see is is this in this multipolarity your understanding is that all of these things are connected and i tell this to my u.s audience all the time I say our foreign policy is our domestic policy. The United States constantly has issues with policing, constantly has issues with crime, constantly has issues with uh, with violence. That is because the the violence is is within the, the the empire, and the empire exports that violence elsewhere. People just don't see it because it's not coming from an outside force; it's coming from an inside force. So, what the people of the West need to realize is the enemy is not Russia, the enemy is not Africa, the enemy is not Latin America. It's not the you know the Middle East and all these. People they were told are, are their enemy. Uh, the enemy is not China. The enemy is, is their own government. And, and it's up to the people of the United States, which is why I'm, I'm in here in Moscow, which is why I, I want to travel to as many times as I can to Donbass and to other places that have been uh, just subjected to U.S. hegemony, because it is up to the people of the United States, in my opinion, more than anybody else in the world. Sure, the people of Europe, sure, the people in the UK, but the people of the United States right now to really understand that they're being weaponized against each other and against other civilians um, by their own government. And then they're being used to fund a fascist and to re rehabilitate the Nazism and, and this sort of death cult that we have um, in the world is all because of, of U.S. hegemony. change the narrative that you've actually highlighted uh, so many things concerning the African uh, continent and we are in a moment that is uh, very buoyant and across Africa. We see perspectives changing, a uh, wind of change, change, uh, wind of change uh, blowing not only in the political sphere but actually in the economic sphere. And we are continuing, we have uh, uh, some eight minutes to be together. Let me. Uh, Go swiftly to you, uh, uh, Anna Devley. We talk about uh, uh, the, the the quest by the West to to, to actually uh, defeat Russia in Africa, seeing how they can in. Uh, impose their ideologies on Africans, but then uh, things are not the same. So let's look at this. We uh, earlier highlighted the issue of sovereignty. And now how how can, uh, of course, we ensure the sovereignty of African states in this uh, present juncture where there is a hike in geopolitics across the African uh, continent? We are talking about uh, uh, the uh, uh, quest by international powers to, to have the sphere of influence in Africa. How can the, the, the African uh, countries already conversant with all these uh, uh, political maneuvers, how can the African continent ensure uh, that uh, they maintain their sovereignty in spite of the hike in geopolitics? Well, this is the uh, heart of the question of the matter. Uh, it's all bearing on staying the course, as I say. Uh, now, uh, there's been precedent. Uh, uh, we've seen it uh, again in RDC and uh, Mali and uh, Burkina Faso. But NATO is by no 
be uh, standing back and wait, you know, waiting for the uh, the uh, historical sequence to pass by. As we speak right now, uh, NATO is uh, repositioning itself in Mauritania as a client state, and uh, probably uh, is going to be using that state as a launching pad for destabilization. So they will be using what we've been seeing them use for the last 20, 25 years, which is proxy groups. We know that the uh, Sahel uh, desert um, region, which is huge, very difficult to uh, uh, administer and, and, and uh, supervise, will be probably uh, a, a version time stand of the Syrian Badia, you know, this, this desert in this upper center uh, part of the country. Which is uh, uh, an ideal place for those uh, terrorist organizations, Haram, like ISIS. Uh, they will be they will be shipping, you know, people from uh, from Syria to Libya, to Libya into uh, uh, you know Central Africa, uh, the, the the Great Lake areas, merging them with other groups. Uh, this is what the West does. They uh, constantly recycle those uh, those proxy groups. And use them as their surrogates whenever they want to try to, at the very least, prevent the emergence of uh, uh, you know uh, governments that are contrary to what they want to see in the region. Uh, I would take that one example, uh, which is something that should be uh, kept uh, you know um, observed with a lot of attention, is the uh, use of those so-called uh, airbrand words. I've seen them. Uh, Having uh, diverse uh, expressions uh, in Africa, mostly in Morocco and Sudan. Uh, for now, obviously, Sudan uh, it all bears on whether or not uh, the Russian Federation will be able to uh, build a base, a naval base there, uh, bearing on the uh, the uh, Red Sea and the Strait of Bab al Mandeb, a very important strait there off the coast of Yemen. Uh, and the Abraham Accord basically are trying to, you know, lure the uh, Sudanese military to, you know, uh, uh, choose their side and choose wisely. Uh, again, I, likewise in Morocco, uh, in exchange for uh, Western, i.e. American recognition of uh, uh, Western Sahara, Morocco has basically allowed uh, the... Uh, Israeli state to establish a base there. Uh, and you can bet sure that when the Israelis land in town, uh, this is not good news. This is going to be uh, most likely uh, a transition to more destabilization. Uh, and i.e., uh, I mean, in that sense, the Algerian state, Algeria has expressed its willingness uh, not only to uh, uh, join BRICS. But also has expressed its uh, willingness to be counted as a member of what's called in the Middle East the Resistance Movement, uh, which is composed of Iraq, uh, a significant uh, segment of Lebanese society, uh, Syria, and Iran, and now also Yemen. Uh, so Algeria is obviously in the crosshair of uh, the Americans, the French for historical reasons, and now the Israelis. A lot of gas there. It's uh, it's a gateway to uh, to Africa into Mali. The uh, French military must uh, fly over Algeria during the the barcade, uh, you know, in operation in uh, in Mali to get there. Uh, so it's uh, it's a fundamental uh, domino that uh, you can expect uh, uh, the West to go after. Um, I think within the next five years, I would say. It's they've been uh, each group for. For quite some time, but now the overall context in Africa with the emancipation movement and the getting out of the framework of the Berlin Conference, something that's already new, uh, will probably prompt uh, the West to, uh, you know, focus their attention on Africa and Algeria. So, uh, as PK mentioned, it, it's, a, it's an artificial division scheme. Uh, they will uh, basically. Uh, Use uh, any kind of cynical ploy, looking at every country one by one. Uh, what do you need? And what would you like us to provide you with? Even though we may not have the legitimacy to provide it and give it to you or recognize it on your behalf, but uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, muscle our way through the uh, what's left of the uh, uh, global institutions 
a bit of veneer of legality, but in exchange, you know, you gotta basically be a client state. The uh, interesting question is obviously uh, how long it's going to take uh, those remaining client states to understand finally, at long last, that vassals of the West usually don't end up uh, in good stead, uh, quite the contrary. And so, you know, that lesson is finally uh, uh, learned and, 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 and kept in hand by an overwhelming majority of uh, the 50 plus states on the African continent. I think, uh, you know, the outcome is pretty clear and, and there's no ambiguity as to where, uh, you know, those tactics will lead to, which is, you know, um, to nowhere, essentially. So, right now, I think we have to, uh, Again, be uh, focused, uh, you know, and 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 refrain from celebrating. You know, this is going to be a long haul fight. Probably, it's going to take the better part of the uh, ongoing decade. But it is something that must happen if uh, we are to uh, basically uh, uh, move on to a new paradigm in international relation, and uh, and in uh, guarantee international security as such. Um, I think is that. Obviously, uh, the uh, state of the Western economies, and mostly European economies, France, but to name it, you know, France, French economy, is so heavily on African resources for its uh, energy needs, uh, will, uh, you know, either descend into chaos or come to some kind of revising of uh, how it's been doing, you know, uh, 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 a foreign policy the last uh, 60 years plus since uh, uh, the late, I would say the late 1950s, uh, and start, you know, basically, uh, they, they can build on the Francophonie, they can build on their, their second maritime, uh, you know, domain in the world. Fran uh, France has got a lot going for itself, it doesn't need to go out and, and pillage resources. Uh, it will uh, grow uh, uh, the better for it if it sits down. Uh, and uh, with uh, uh, the people with whom it shares historical ties and, and you know, act uh, as uh, equal and pay the right price for the resources, which I'm sure uh, the African countries are just uh, dying to basically sell, but, you know, not to get stiffed uh, with this kind of uh, arrangements uh, that we've seen uh, the last, uh, again, 60 years plus. Okay, thank you so much, uh, dear uh, Anna Davlia, uh, for the uh, great insight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't uh, continue because we're already above our time. Uh, I want to acknowledge you all for the great insight on this very important uh, uh, discussion to remind our viewers that we are joined today by Anna Davli, is an international rights uh, lawyer, also joined by Enrique Rifoyo, political analyst and a journalist who joined from Spain and Fiorella Isabel, journalist and also geopolitical analyst. I wish to say thank you to you all for the great insight on this particular topic and of course hoping to have you still uh, some other time on the Pan-African television, Africa media, to continue to discuss uh, issues that are of utmost importance that are of course uh, uh, affecting uh, the global world in our spheres. Thank you for your greater uh, input and to the technical crew thank you for ensuring uh, that this program was a success but then uh, uh, to those of you watching don't go away uh, keep having a lovely moment in the company of transmissions on the pan-african television afric media bye bye <music>